Ah, the Ten Commandments, those ancient rules handed down from on high. But what happens when these uh, sacred laws find their way into the secular halls of public schools? Well, uh, that's where things get interesting. We're about to dive into a topic that's causing quite a stir, the intersection of faith, law and education. So grab your thinking caps and let's dive headfirst into the fascinating world of God's law and its contentious place in modern society. Picture this. It's 2025 and you're a student in a Louisiana public school. As you settle into your desk, you glance at the wall and there it is, in all its glory, a poster of the Ten Commandments staring back at you. In a bold move, Louisiana lawmakers have mandated that every public school classroom in the state must prominently display the Ten Commandments by January 2025. Naturally, this decision hasn't gone unnoticed. Opponents, including groups like the ACLU, argue that the law blatantly disregards the separation of church and state. However, supporters claim it's a victory for history and morality, pointing to recent Supreme Court rulings that seem to be shifting the landscape on religious expression in public spaces. Louisiana, the land of jazz, gumbo, and now a whole lot of controversy. By January 2025, every public school classroom in the state will be graced with the presence of these ancient laws. The stated aim to highlight the historical significance of the commandments. But let's be honest, we can smell the whiff of religious motivation wafting all the way from Baton Rouge. Naturally, this has sparked a right old ruckus. Those who cherish the separation of church and state are positively spitting fire. But Louisiana? They're banking on the shifting sands of the Supreme Court, where recent rulings on religious expression have emboldened those eager to blur the lines between church and state. Fasten your seatbelts because this legal battle is about to get bumpy. On one side, opponents claim that Louisiana law is a blatant violation of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. On the other side, supporters argue that the Ten Commandments are more than just religious doctrine. They're the bedrock of Western law and morality. The crux of the matter lies in the interpretation of historical significance versus religious endorsement. The debate over the Ten Commandments in schools is hardly new. Back in the 1960s, the Supreme Court ruled against school-sponsored Bible readings and prayer, deeming them unconstitutional endorsements of religion. However, the court also left the door ajar for the study of religion from a historical and literary perspective. The Louisiana case is but the latest chapter in this ongoing saga, a stark reminder that the past is never truly past. Uh, right, let's talk about these Ten Commandments, shall we? They weren't exactly scribbled on the back of a cocktail napkin, you know. Turns out they were around long before Moses scaled Mount Sinai, tablet in hand. Take Abraham, for instance. The Bible tells us he was a stickler for these commandments, even before they were cool. And the Sabbath, that whole day of rest thing, yeah, that was already a thing back in Exodus. Long before the big reveal on the mountain, it's important to understand that God's law wasn't some arbitrary invention. These commandments weren't just a whim, they were, and are, fundamental truths about right and wrong. Now let's be clear, the Ten Commandments aren't just some dusty relics of a bygone era, they were, and are, deeply significant for those who subscribe to the Christian faith. Exodus 23-17 lays out these commandments, not as suggestions, but as direct instructions from God himself. Romans 3.20 tells us, that the law in all its glory has a rather specific function to show us just how much we fall short. It's like holding a mirror up to our souls, revealing all the ways we miss the mark. So the commandments aren't there to make us feel good about ourselves. They're there to expose our flaws and point us towards something bigger. Now I know what you're thinking. This all sounds rather gloomy. Is God's law just about catching us out, making us feel bad? Well, not quite. You see, there are blessings involved too. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 1 and 2 spells it out. Follow the rules, good things happen. The psalmist describes God's law as perfect, trustworthy, and even sweeter than honey. Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 to 33 talks about a new covenant, one where God's law is written on our hearts, not just stone tablets. And then there's Matthew chapter 22 verses 36 to 40, where Jesus sums it all up rather neatly. Love God, love your neighbor. It's not about burdensome rules. It's about reflecting God's character in everything we do. Now, I know what you're thinking. Didn't Jesus come along and say, right, enough of these rules, free love and sandals for everyone? Well, not exactly. See, 
Jesus wasn't in the business of abolishing the law, he was in the business of fulfilling it. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 18 makes it crystal clear. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law, but to give it its full and complete meaning. He lived a perfect life reflecting God's law in every way, and then he took the punishment for our failures upon himself. John chapter 14, verse 15 drives this point home. If we love Jesus, we'll keep his commandments. He didn't abolish it, he lived it, breathed it, and ultimately fulfilled it. And that, my friends, changes everything. Friends, now let's rewind the cosmic clock a bit, back to a time before iPhones, Twitter, and even Earth itself. Enter Satan, the original bad boy, the first to stage a cosmic coup. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 15, paints a rather vivid picture of his downfall from the heights of heaven to the depths of darkness. At the heart of Satan's rebellion was a rejection of God's law, a refusal to submit to the authority of the Almighty. Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 12 to 17 gives us a glimpse into Satan's prideful heart, his desire to be like God, to set his own rules, to rewrite the very fabric of reality. Now Satan's a crafty one, not the type to storm the pearly gates with a pitchfork and a bad attitude. No, he prefers a more subtle approach, a whisper here, a suggestion there planting seeds of doubt and discontent. Remember that whole Garden of Eden debacle? That wasn't just a case of bad fruit and poor impulse control, that was Satan, disguised as a charming serpent, whispering half-truths and tempting promises. Adam and Eve, seduced by the promise of forbidden knowledge and the allure of becoming like God, took the bait, rejecting God's clear command and plunging humanity into a world of sin and separation. Now Satan's a master of spin, a true PR nightmare for the Almighty. He paints God as a cosmic killjoy, a divine dictator holding back our true potential with his pesky rules and regulations. But this, my friends, is a lie, a blatant misrepresentation of God's character. God's law isn't some arbitrary set of rules designed to make our lives miserable. It's an expression of his love, a blueprint for living in harmony with him, with ourselves and with each other. What if, instead of seeing God's law as a tool of oppression, we saw it as a reflection of his love, a guide to living a life of purpose and meaning? Now you might be thinking, this is, this, is, this is all very well and good, but what does Satan's ancient rebellion have to do with me? I'm not exactly planning to overthrow heaven anytime soon, but here's the thing. Satan's rebellion isn't just some ancient history lesson, it's an ongoing reality. His whispers of discontent, his promises of freedom through disobedience, they're still echoing through the corridors of our hearts. Every time we choose to ignore our conscience, every time we prioritize our own desires above the needs of others, we're aligning ourselves with that original act of rebellion. But there's another way, a path of peace and restoration. It's the path of surrender, of acknowledging our need for something larger than ourselves, something to guide us through the complexities of life. Now, you might be thinking, what does a bunch of ancient Hebrew laws have to do with our modern, sophisticated world? Well, my friends, more than you might imagine, you see that ancient rebellion we talked about, it's not confined to the dusty pages of scripture. Oh no, it's alive and well, playing out in the headlines of our newspapers and on the screens of our devices. Look around, my friends, what do you see? A rejection of authority, a blurring of moral lines, a relentless pursuit of self-gratification, even at the expense of others. Sound familiar? It's the echo of Eden, the reverberation of that first no uttered in defiance of God's good design. We've swapped fig leaves for designer labels, but the underlying rebellion remains the same. We crave autonomy, the freedom to define our own reality, to declare ourselves the masters of our own fate. And just like Adam and Eve, we find ourselves entangled in the thorns and thistles of our own making. The very efforts to remove religious elements from public spaces, to silence any mention of God or his law, well, that's just another manifestation of this rebellion. It's an attempt to rewrite the narrative, to create a world where we're not accountable to any higher power, where our desires reign supreme. Now, some might argue that the Ten Commandments are outdated, irrelevant in a world grappling with climate change, economic inequality and global pandemics. Surely, they say, we have more pressing matters to attend to than archaic rules about graven images and coveting our neighbor's donkey. But here's the thing, the Ten Commandments aren't just a random assortment of thou shalts and thou shalt nots. They're a blueprint for a just and compassionate society 
a framework for human flourishing. Don't believe me? Let's take a closer look. Honor your father and mother. A recipe for generational warfare? I think not. Do not murder, steal, or bear false witness. Sounds like a pretty solid foundation for a safe and trustworthy community, wouldn't you say? And that whole do not covet bit, well, that's a direct challenge to the consumerism and envy that fuels so much of our discontent. You see, the Ten Commandments aren't outdated, they're uh, countercultural. They offer a radical alternative to the self-serving individualism that pervades our modern world. The presence of these commandments in schools, however controversial it may be, serves as a stark reminder that there is a moral order beyond our fleeting opinions and shifting cultural norms. Now let's be honest, shall we? The real problem with God's law isn't its relevance, but its revelation. You see, the law in all its clarity and wisdom exposes something deeply uncomfortable within us, our own shortcomings. It holds up a mirror to our souls, revealing the cracks and crevices of our selfishness, our pride, our tendency to stray from what we know to be right. And that, my friends, is what Satan, the original rebel, can't stand. He hates the law because it exposes his lies, his attempts to distort our perception of God and lure us into his web of deceit. He knows that as long as we cling to the illusion of our own righteousness, as long as we refuse to acknowledge our need for forgiveness and transformation, we'll remain trapped in his grasp. Think about it. Why all the fuss about removing religious symbols, about silencing any mention of God's standards? Could it be that deep down we'd rather not be reminded of our own fallibility? That we prefer the comfort of moral relativism, where right and wrong are fluid, ever-shifting, subject to our own interpretation? But here's the good news. God's law, while revealing our sin, also points the way to freedom. It's not about condemnation, it's about transformation. It's about recognizing our need for grace, for a power outside ourselves to break the chains of our self-destructive patterns and set us on a path of true fulfillment. Well, we've journeyed from the ancient plains of Mesopotamia to the modern classrooms of Louisiana, haven't we? We've explored the history, the controversy, and the deeper spiritual significance of God's law. And what have we discovered? That these ancient commandments, far from being irrelevant relics of a bygone era, are still stirring up quite a fuss. Who knew that a few thou shalts and thou shalt nots could be so potent, so capable of igniting passions and dividing communities? But that's the thing about truth, isn't it? It has a way of getting under our skin, of challenging our assumptions, of exposing the gap between our ideals and our actions. We may have replaced stone tablets with smartphones, but the human heart, with its capacity for both good and evil, remains remarkably unchanged. And so the Ten Commandments, in all their stark simplicity, still stand as a mirror to our souls, reflecting both our highest aspirations and our deepest flaws. Now, I'm not here to preach, nor am I here to tell you what to think, but I would be remiss if I didn't point out that we're faced with a choice. We can continue down the path of rebellion, of trying to rewrite the rules, of declaring ourselves the ultimate arbiters of right and wrong. But let's be honest, that path leads to a rather messy and unsatisfying destination, a world where everyone does what is right in their own eyes, with little regard for the well-being of others. Or we can choose another way, a path of humility, of acknowledging that perhaps, just perhaps, there's a wisdom greater than our own. We can choose to engage with God's law, not as a weapon to bludgeon others with, but as a tool for self-reflection, for growth, for becoming the kind of people who reflect the very character of the one who etched those words in stone. As we leave the hallowed halls of history and return to our modern world, let's not be too quick to dismiss the relevance of these ancient laws. Let's grapple with them, wrestle with them, allow them to challenge our assumptions and refine our understanding of what it means to be truly human. The invitation remains open, my friends. Will we cling to our rebellion or will we reach for something more? The choice, as always, is ours.